all uh, the book of Philippians, the second chapter. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, if you want to look in your Bibles. If not, it's up here on the screen. And Paul writes, uh, beginning in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. Just to focus on that last scripture, uh, which is where we'll end, uh, that we should do all things without murmuring and arguing so that you might be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. Amen. I'm going to be talking about the subject of work. Uh, today, but if I were to give a little bit of a subtext that might make you uh, feel a little bit better, uh, look at the person next to you and say, shine. shine. And that, that, feel, that feel a lot better than work. Huh? Look at me again and say, shine. shine. All right, so if work is tripping you out, you can just make it like I'm talking about shine. All right? We all like to shine. There are several ways, I, I believe, as we think about the way of Jesus, of understanding Jesus and understanding Christianity in our world. And I'm always uh, trying to call our attention to that because uh, there are a lot of Jesuses out there. And so we always, I believe, have to continue to remind ourselves uh, who is the Jesus that is informing how it is that we are seeking to live, uh, how we are seeking to be faithful, uh, how we are seeking to... Uh, follow God in the world uh, that we're living in. I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago and we were laughing because I was telling a group of folks, I said, you know, there is a, a, a Scandinavian Jesus out there in a bathrobe with a perm. And I said, but I don't follow that Jesus. Not because he's Scandinavian, but because there is an image of Christ, which oftentimes is this kind of conquering Christ, this, this Christ who is uh, the one that comes in to conquer and to rule and to dominate and, and the one who comes in to stamp down and flush out. And it's this Jesus that's riding in on the horse with a weapon in his hand. But I connect a lot more to the idea of Jesus as that, you know, light brown skinned Palestinian Jew that lives on the underside of the Roman Empire. That young brother that was actually dealing with oppression, that young brother that was actually dealing with inequity, that young brother that had a message that he was bringing to uh, his colleagues and his counterparts, calling them that they could work towards a world that was better and a world that God wanted them to have without becoming their enemy. That they could actually achieve the victory of God without engaging in the craziness of their generation and their world. And the reason I lift that up is because I think at the end of the day, all of us, when you think about your life, you're trying to figure out how do you win. Yes. If we just keep it real, right? I mean, especially some of us younger folks. Now, I found when I talk to more seasoned people, they get to a stage in life where they realize that winning is really not that important. But with a lot of us that are a little bit younger, we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how to win. Right? How do I win? How can I make as much money as I possibly can make in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of energy? <laughs> right? So I can go on a vacation. Right? Look at the person next to you and say, I want to win. <laughs> you see how easy that rolled off the tongue? Right? It was just like saying cheesecake. I want to win. Right? We all want to win. We all want to figure out how to be successful. We want to figure out how to accumulate the most power. We want to figure out how to accumulate uh, the most affirmation from our neighbors. We spend time, uh, the whole idea of shopping. You know, my family loves to shop. Amen. And, and, and you know, we all spend time in stores because you're trying to find just that right outfit. Right? There's a lot of clothes in there, but how many know, I know personally, like, you know, everything ain't made for everybody. Amen. So, <laughs> there's some shirts I bought, and I've, I've put it on. You, you ever have one of those moments where you buy something in the store that you think's gonna look good on you, so you don't try it on? Right? <laughs> then you get home, and it seems like somewhere between the store and your house, that shirt took on a different form. 
shirt on and I look like I'm in the middle of an incredible Hulk explosion, right? Just, <laughs> can't breathe, buttons hanging on, you know. <laughs> right. but, but we go shopping and we, we engage in all this work around our look and around what we do because we want to win. We want to show up, we want people to feel good about us. We, we want to be affirmed. Maybe some of us are a little bit more free than some of these things. Some of us are still in recovery. Some of us are in need of inter intervention, right? We all at different places along this continuum. But at the end of the day, all of us want to win. And I think the challenge that we find ourselves in many times is how do we uh, partner with what God is trying to call us to do and at the same time still accomplish that which we're trying to do? Right? That we live in that tension between the already and the not yet. Oh, all right. Right? I'm not who I want to be, right. but I'm already in a situation that, that is, and i got to figure out, how do I contend for what God is calling for in the world, and at the same time, I want to win. Amen. And so I, I think Paul speaks very well. One of the reasons I like a lot of the letters in the New Testament is because it was Paul having conversations, particularly with a kind of uh, area like the Philippians and the Ephesians and the Colossians, these people very much so like Bay Area type folks. They lived on a major seaport in a hub of technology and industry and innovation and so these were people they were not Jews, many of them they were not necessarily coming from a, a place of, of, of uh, you know, the kind of oppression that some of them had been experiencing. They had a different kind of capacity to gain wealth uh, they were trying to find their way in the world and Paul is trying to talk to them about the tension of, of wanting to win same time giving themselves to the ways of God. And so Paul in this uh, letter is actually in jail. Paul is incarcerated. I think it's a real cool thing for us to always remember that the majority of the New Testament is written from behind bars. That when you read Galatians and Philippians, when you read the Gospel of John, when you read Ephesians, when, that this is written from somebody who is in jail. This isn't somebody writing, you know, sitting up, you know, on, on cribs, you know, with his, his feet kicked up, sipping a pina colada, right? Paul is in prison, oftentimes house arrest, under the supervision of the Roman guard. All right. Who are standing outside his door with swords. And Paul is writing these words that we're reading. And Paul is writing to the Philippians, trying to encourage them to stay on the path that he sent them on and not be discouraged because they're looking at his plight. Yes, yes. Because I think what Paul was worried about was, I know you all were with me when I was with you in Philippi. Yeah. When I was doing my little Paul thing, and I, I, don't know, you know, I don't know if Paul used to do that, but you know, in my world, Paul does that, right? So, you know. Paul was giving them the little Paul preach and, you know, talking about finally my brother be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And everybody was like, Paul preaching, Paul preaching, right? Paul was working it all out. But then Paul is in jail. And Paul's writing them a letter and saying, I don't want you to give up the hope of what you had because you're now looking at a final result in my life that doesn't look like a win. All right. Like Paul said, when I was with you all and I was writing my letters and, and I was doing everything I was doing, you were all with me because I had all these great stories. Yeah. I was showing up talking about what happened at Ephesus and I was showing up talking about what happened at Colossae and I was showing up talking about what happened at Jerusalem and, and what happened when me and Peter was together and me and John was together and me and James were together. And I was telling you all these stories and, and you were with me because we were telling you about how we healed the sick and we raised people back to life and all these wonderful stories but now I'm writing to you from jail. You've started hearing the stories of people being killed because they follow Jesus. Yes. And now this thing doesn't look as sexy as it once did. Mm. Right. And Paul's writing to them about the work mm. that it takes to follow Jesus. The first thing Paul lifts up in Philippians 2 is he tells them to work out their salvation. First point I want to talk about is this idea of what it means to work out. All right. Right? That Paul writes uh, with his concerns. Uh, Paul wanted to call them to a higher way of being that was about their lives being poured out and sacrificial. Paul lifts up for them that they need to work out their salvation, taking initiative 
collectively and individually to actually live out the way of Jesus that they saw him live out and the stories that they told out regardless of the penalty that was around them and that they were seeing in his life. You see, we are called to practice the Jesus way in a world when it is advantageous, but mostly when it is disadvantageous. We're not just called to follow Jesus when it's sexy. All right. Right? We're not just called to follow Jesus when there's money at the end of the line. We're not just called to follow Jesus when it feels good. We're not just called to follow Jesus when everybody else wants to follow Jesus. But we're called to follow Jesus in the times where you mostly don't want to follow Jesus. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? You know, it's one of the things, you know, I didn't know I was getting ready to quote him, but I'll quote him because I thought it was a great point. Minister Farrakhan, one of the things that I heard in one of the messages he was preaching is he said, you know, my challenge is, he said, a lot of people want to believe in Jesus, but they don't want to follow Jesus. Ooh, some of y'all got to put that in your pipe and smoke it. That was pretty good, right? He said, they want to believe in Jesus, but not follow Jesus. Because what does it mean to follow Jesus? All right. What does it mean to actually live a life that has people looking for you who want to kill you? What does it mean to live such a life that when you go to church, they run you out your church and try to throw you off a cliff? Let the person next to you would say, follow Jesus. Oh, <laughs> well, that was pretty cold, wasn't it? When you go and you actually cast the demons out of young people in the city who have been possessed by darkness and been possessed by violence, and when you cast them out and free them, the people in the city drive you out of the city. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Look at the person that you would say, follow Jesus. Oh, this is the person that has the power to feed 5,000 people, yet only uses his power when it's to serve others and not to gain his own personal wealth. Look at somebody and say, follow Jesus. follow Jesus. Just think if some of us, commercial, just think if you had the capacity to create a million dollars by just speaking it. And the kind of discipline it takes to not do so. And only, she had to breathe it out. She was like, <laughs> That you would only do it when it is in service to the will of God. Somebody say, follow Jesus. follow Jesus. So Paul is pushing them to follow Jesus to work out their salvation. This idea of working out means that to follow Jesus means that we are actually going to have to be engaged in disciplined living and disciplined decisions that we should already be prepared will resist our natural way of being. All right. Following Jesus is not meant to feel good. Amen. Amen. I've, I've tried for years to try to be the blessed preacher. That's just not me. So if you want the blessed preacher, like go to TBN and stuff, and they'll give you like, Woo, you know, God don't give you money. You get all of that at home, and you got to leave outside. All right. The Jesus I try to rock with this idea is following Jesus is gonna cost you something. It's supposed to be tough. It's supposed to cause. Uh, it's supposed to cause some. Uh, some challenge. It's supposed to resist your way of being. It's the same thing like working out in the physical. Oh, yeah. Last year, you know, I, I was uh, leaving my, my job and I took a month sabbatical uh, just because I was like, you know, I'm going to, you know, get in shape and get some rest. So I hired a personal trainer. And I hired a personal trainer because I knew if I just went to the gym on my own, I was going to work out at a pace you know, that, that, you know, work with my sensibilities. Uh, have, you, have you ever been at the gym? Yes. And you're working out, and you know you should go a little more, but you're just like, eh. you know, you look at that clock, you're like, yeah, I've done enough. But, you know, I feel a little sweat beads, I've done enough. You know, you, you start walking around, talking to people, start looking at the machines, mm, that's interesting. Uh, I'm like, I've been here about 40 minutes, so my wife should think I actually worked out, now I'm trying to go home, right? <laughs> so I said, I'm gonna hire me a personal trainer. So I hired this brother who, who, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you like this. I walked into his gym, and there wasn't no, like, machines and stuff. <laughs> so I'm kind of standing there, like, okay, where's that 
everything. There was like big medicine balls on the ground and ropes and 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 like dumbbells, just loose dumbbells. And I was like, so what are we about to do? He was like, no, we about to work out. I was like, all right. And so when we got done, we, I worked out for an hour, right? We got done, I was like, oh man, that was great, right on, man. Thank you, thank you. You know, he gave me a couple breaks, I was like, right on. So, you know, because I got my little machismo thing, and I'm still trying to get over my little false definitions of masculinity and all that, so, you know, I'm trying to hold it all down. I'm like, all right, man, I see you. We went out the door, as soon as he closed the door, I was like, oh. <laughs> to my car and my legs were barely shaking. I was like, and no lie, I actually fell into the car. Opened it up. I was sweating from places I didn't even know you sweat from. Right? I got home, my wife was like, how'd it go? I was like, I don't think I can do this. Right? This idea of working out, right, is happening because when you're out of shape, what it takes to get in shape is painful. And it's going to cost you something if you do it right. I was so sore. After, and I had signed up for this thing where we were working out twice a week. So then I'm sitting there like, oh my God. You know, I was sore, I was irritable, I was mad at the kids, they didn't even do nothing. Now move, move, you know? What I'm looking up for is like Paul is telling us we must work out our salvation. It's this same idea that we must work out and be engaged in the kind of work and activity that is going to resist the way that we are. So it calls us into a better way of being. That we shouldn't actually, if you're trying to work out your salvation, the idea is not to pick areas that you already feel comfortable in. Right. Or activities that you already feel comfortable doing. Right. Because the activities you feel comfortable doing are not producing the results you need. Right. So you're going to have to engage in some different work. Yeah. You're going to have to be, uh, you're going to have to go through some different things. When you work out, you stink. After. <laughs> right? During. Amen. Working out, then you have to go get a shower. Yes. And clean up. It is a process and a discipline. And what I want to hold up for some of us is this idea of working out our salvation is supposed to bring us into some stinky moments. Some uncomfortable spaces. That working out our salvation means that when we get done working out and going through some things that are refining us, we're going to have to take some clothes off we used to wear. Yeah. I'm not talking about physical clothes. I'm not on oh, no, I'm not on that tip. I'm talking about there's some garments and some ways of being that have been comfortable for us that must be released. There's a different way that we have to begin to become. And what Paul is pushing on there while he's in jail is he's saying, you must be disciplined to follow the way of Jesus, recognizing that jail can be a part of it, but you can't be so afraid of the challenge that might come by working out your salvation that you don't live into the way that Jesus is calling us to be. Jude chapter 1, verses 20. I like this scripture. Uh, it talks about how uh, we need to build up. But you, dear friends, carefully build yourselves up in this most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. Staying right at the center of God's love, keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our Master Jesus Christ. This is the unending life, the real life. Go easy on those who hesitate in the faith. Go after those who take the wrong way. Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. The sin itself stinks to high heaven. Hallelujah. That we are called to build ourselves up, to work out most holy faith through the disciplines of prayer I was raised, I'm going to get off this point but a part of the working out, I, I could do a whole series on working out because I don't work out amen, and I, Lord going to help me after a while right, but, but this idea of working out spiritually means we need to be thinking about, if you don't like to pray you out of shape yeah. That's, not, that's not a shameful thing 
That's not like a, oh man, like man, pills to be in and talking about, I don't know. Man. That's not what it's about. What I'm saying is, we need to figure out, I need to build up my muscle for prayer. I need to build up my muscle for reading the scriptures. I need to build up my muscle for service. I need to build up my muscle to actually be engaged in serving others. I need to build up my muscle to have courage to stand for justice. I need to build up this muscle. And the writer says, we got to build it up praying in the Holy Spirit. So the first thing we've got to do in this idea of work is to work out. The second thing that uh, Paul lifts up for them is he says uh, also that you realize that it is God who is at work in you. I want to talk about work in. Somebody say work in. So I think one of the things you got to realize is while you want to work out, you also must realize that the only way to work out is to allow God to work in. Right? Paul reminds the believers that the power to work out your salvation is always fueled by the power of God working inside of you. Rather than allowing them to be become confused as to their power source, Paul centers their progress on the inner working of God. We must remember that we must have God working inside of us. The divine power that comes from God is what allows us to work out the Jesus way. How many know it's not by our own goodness that we can do what is right in the world? But it is the power of God inside of us. Paul lifts up for them that God is working inside of you. And I think it's an important thing in a world that celebrates, particularly here in the United States of America, in the Western world, that celebrates individuality, individualism. Oh yeah. That celebrates, you know, we built that. Y'all remember that a couple years ago on the political thing, we built that. Everybody likes to give the shade to, to the Republicans, but whether you're a liberal, progressive, I don't care what you are, I tell you I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I follow Jesus. All right. right. I got I find policies that's around that, right? But no matter what where you are, whether you what, what political party it is that you find, uh, we all have this sense of individualism and in that we somehow have accomplished what we have in our life because of our own power. Yeah. I went to school. Right? I went to the school of hard knocks. Right? Everybody, we all feel like I did something that got me where I'm at. And that's why we all get angry when we feel like we get disrespected. Well, not all y'all, maybe me. Maybe it's just my confession time, right? But I, I get upset, like, man, how you gonna come at me like that, man? I done did all this kind of stuff. I deserve this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I deserve my job. I deserve my role. I deserve a certain kind of respect. I deserve a certain kind of interaction. But I think one of the things Paul was pushing on them, which I also believe is countercultural to the world that we live in, is Paul says the only way you're going to be able to do the work God is calling you to do is to allow God to work inside of you. This Jesus way in the world must be powered by God in our lives. God shined his light into our hearts so that we could shine into the world. As we've been talking about this idea of light it up, light up the world, we must recognize that God shined on us so that we could shine on others. God didn't shine on us just for us to get shined on. Right? I know you like yourself. Amen. I like you too. Praise God. Right? But God didn't just shine on you because you fancy. Right? God shines on us so that we can shine on others. We also must remember that none of us has a monopoly on God's shine. All right. All right? I know no matter how solid you feel your theology is, God is never hindered by your theology. The way you understand God. You know, our, our understandings of God don't box God in. What happens when God wants to do something God wants to do? Right? God don't got to come check in with us. Right? I remember one of the stories in the scriptures, Job. You read that up and you have some time. And in the story of Job, Job lost his family. He lost his house. He lost all his wealth. He lost everything. And he looked up at God and was like, man, God, how could you let something like this happen to me? This don't fit my theology. How can you let something like this happen to me? And God responded to Job. He said, Job, where were you when I formed the stars and the sun out there in the space? God has the power to do whatever he wants to do. And rather than us trying to have a monopoly on God's shine, we need to give ourselves to be instruments and
and vehicles that God uses to shine in the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 6 uh, says for God who said let light shine out of the darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And so we need to work out and we need to let God work in and lastly we need to do all of that so that we can work for God's pleasure. God wants us to work out our salvation so we can allow God to work inside of us so that we can work for God's pleasure. Paul tells them that they are to work for God's goodwill and pleasure, reminding them that their lives are no longer their own. Now this was significant, especially in an apocalyptic world. Right? One of the things I think we need to realize is that in the day of uh, Jesus, they believed that the world was coming to an end in their lifetime. So everything that we read in the scriptures was experienced from a, a perspective and an idea that the world was coming to an end. All of Jesus' preaching that was preaching happened inside a context that the world is coming to an end. The apostles writing their letters, the world is coming to an end. That, that was the energy around the readiness. Y'all got to get ready. You've got to make sure you're doing what it is that you need to be doing because the world is coming to an end. And for them, their world did come to an end. Their cities ended up being burnt up and their nations were dispelled and folks went scattered all around the world never to come back to that land for almost 15, 16, 1700 years later. Their world did literally come to an end and I think we must realize that the world as we know it is also coming to an end. Oh, yeah. This world of brokenness, this, this idea of stability that we have is also coming to an end and we must be those who are working for what God wants to happen in our world. In each of our times, we have this sense of apocalyptic tendencies. Now this isn't to minimize our own personal struggles because while the world that we are in is constantly on the track of coming to an end, some of us oftentimes feel like you are having your own personal apocalypse. Yeah. Right? And many times you're like, I don't have any margin to care about what's happening in the world because what's happening on planet me <laughs> is so atomic and challenging and I don't even have any margin to think about what's happening in Berkeley or Oakland or San Francisco. God bless y'all. Y'all want to go out there and scream, shut it down, shut it down. I, I'm shut down at my house. <laughs> right? I ain't got no margin for shut it down. I've been looking for work. That's been shut down. My relationship dynamic, that's shut down. My kids won't listen. That's shut down. Right? I, I got my own shut it down thing going on in my house. But one of the things I want to lift up for us is that God is always asking us, I believe through the scriptures, no matter what sense of an apocalypse we feel like we're in, that we are always called to work for God's pleasure, even in the middle of it. Oh, yeah. I want to challenge us and yet encourage us at the same time that you don't get through your challenge by not working for God. All right. <laughs> you don't get through your, your, your uh, terror or your pain by shutting and not working for God's pleasure. You don't get to the promised land by stopping in the middle of the wilderness. Let the person next to you say, keep on walking. Oh. You, you don't get into the promise by just being like, yeah, man, everything is all messed up, so I'm just about to stand right here and I'm going to wait for God to move me into the promised land. <laughs> God, get up under my feet and you're going to move me into the promised land. No, we get into the promise of God by continuing to work for God's pleasure even in the middle of our own apocalypse. Peter was in the middle of his own pain when he arrived at the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3 and there was a lame man laying there at the gate. Peter had his own problems. Peter had his own realities. But when he saw the man at the gate, he said, silver ain't gold. If you feel like your money is funding, you still got to work for God. If you feel like your relational dynamics are having problems, you still got to work for God. If you can't stand your roommate, you can't stand your mama, you can't stand your daddy, you mad at your boyfriend, you still must work for God. Work 
for God's pleasure. Sometimes the greatest thing that I've experienced is being able to distract myself by righteousness. All right. I used to tell folks years ago that when you when you feel like you're being overrun by despair, and when you're being overrun by discouragement, and you're being overrun by trials, distract yourself with something holy. I'm not going to give no more time to be focused on what's not working. I'm going to focus on what is working. I'm going to actually go serve some folks. I'm going to actually go and give my life to some people. I'm actually going to go and become a hope dealer. I'm actually going to go and see God's world emerge and know that as I put my time in God's world emerging, God will use his energy to cause my world to emerge. That God is asking us to work for God's good pleasure and God's good will because we don't have forever to bring in the world that God wants. John chapter 9 verses 4 and 5 talks about as long as it is day we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world Jesus says, I am the light of the world. All right. Now, one of the things I love in Matthew chapter 5, as I get ready to close, is we love to talk about Jesus saying he is the light of the world. And several times throughout Jesus' ministry, he talks about being the light of the world. He talks about shining his light into the dark places. But in Matthew 5, Jesus looks at us, he looks at his followers, he looks at his disciples, and he says, you are the light of the world. You are a city that has been set on top of a hill. You are the lamp that's been put on the table. You are the light that God has provided in a dark world to bring light for the work that God wants to happen in the world. So I want to encourage somebody today to not say who you are not or what you cannot do or what your limitations are or what you can say or I don't have the ability to talk or I don't have the ability to create or I don't have the ability to do but if you will work for God's good will and God's pleasure I'm here to witness and tell you that God will work on your behalf that God will open up doors that God will get in your hands that God will get in your mind and that God will cause you to be a part of the world that he is making but we've got to learn how to have a yes in our spirit I know you feel like giving up, but take one step closer to God's way. I know you don't feel like doing it, but one step towards God's will, one step towards God's way, and God will open up doors that no man can close. Somebody say God's way. We are called as people who follow Jesus to be faithful. Maturity yes. and my full completion. Oh, yes. Maybe you're a student in school. I don't even know what I'm going to do with my life. Faithful is the one who called you. And if you will work for God's good pleasure, look at your schooling as how can it be used for God's good pleasure? Look at your vocation. How can it be used for God's good pleasure? Look at your relationships. How can they be used for God's good pleasure? Look at where you live. Whether you live in the birds or whether you live on the block. God's good push. Right. That God, my life is available oh, yes. to you. Thank you, Lord. And I'm here to bear witness that if you will give your life in service to God's way, doesn't matter how young you are, 
Doesn't matter how mature you are in age. If we will continue to give our lives to God's good pleasure, we will see a benefit and a way of living that goes beyond anything that our world might create. Oh, yeah. I conclude with this thought. As Paul talks to them about the work, he invites them to do so by saying that you're living in a crooked and a perverse generation. Paul says the resistance is there. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have more choices to go your own way than you are going to go God's way. You're going to have more choices to just be angry than you are to choose love. You're going to have more opportunities to lean into violence than you are to hold up peace. But God calls us to choose God's way. And Paul says, if you do, he says, you will shine like the stars. I submit that our world is not in need of more celebrities. We got enough of that. We actually have a generation obsessed with the whole idea of celebrity. We're willing to do anything to be famous. But what would it look like if we sought the fame of God? We sought to be stars not defined by our crooked and perverse generation, oh, yeah. but stars defined by the divine standard of God. Stand on your feet.